Um, so I'm, I'm really talking today about Norfolk, the county of Norfolk, which is in the east of England, over towards the North Sea. Um, and the, ca the capital of um, Norfolk, the capital city is Norwich. And I'm just trying to, here we are. Um, in Norwich. And these are the villages in uh, highlighted, I'm going to be referring to some of those um, during the talk. And if you are, are in the UK and you want to visit these places, you can easily take a train to Kings Lynn or a train to Norwich. So um, I'm going to be talking about stained glass. And here is an image from a medieval manuscript showing glass being made. And it's made from sand mixed with alkali and with lime as a stabilizer. The mixture is heated and you can see a furnace here and then it can be shaped or blown. Glass can be left white or given a yellow color known as silver stain. For the deep blues, reds and greens which we're going to see in this presentation, these are made by adding metal oxides such as cobalt for blue, copper for red and iron for green. Now let's look at our first image of stained glass in Norfolk. And this is in the church of Saxlingham Navigate, which isn't too far from Norwich. And it's of St Edmund, a king of East Anglia, king of the Norfolk area in the ninth century, who was killed by arrows. And you can see him holding arrows. And this helps us identify him as St Edmund. The glass was made in about 1250 and it's one of the oldest surviving pieces in Norfolk. And here you see the deep blue, the deep green that I've just been talking about, made from adding oxides. Over time and with improvements to glass making, colours became less dense and let more light into the church and more white glass came to be used. And here we move on almost 100 years from St Edmund to about 1315. And this is in the church of North Elmham. And you can see here an image of the Virgin and Child, Mary and the Child Jesus. It's damaged with age. You can see the face has been damaged um, and it's blackened, um, it's stained, it's corroded. But it's a beautiful image, a beautiful curved image of a seated figure. Let's move on now, um, slightly in time, to the church of Milam. Again, not far from North Elmham. And we're now in the 1340s. So we've moved from 1250 to 1315 and we're in the 1340s. And again, you can see the yellow, the deep red, the deep green, and the deep blue. And these are three figures um, of saints, St. Catherine, St. John the Baptist, and St. Margaret. And we can identify them, and people in the Middle Ages would have been identified them. St. Catherine with her wheel and her sword, because she was put to death on a wheel. St. John the Baptist with his camel hair, uh, covering and the lamb and St Margaret with the dragon because she was supposed to have subdued a dragon um, and her staff and the important thing to remember about these is that these were very three very popular saints which would have been instantly recognizable in the middle ages whether you were a rich man a poor man whether you were a king or a monk they were instantly recognizable now, just to make a point about recognizability, I'm going to skip on. I should say before I move on that um, I'm very grateful to Michael Womack uh, for this image. And I know that Joanna is on the, on the um, uh, call here. So thank you to Michael for this image. Um, I'm skipping on here now a century just to make a point. This is another image of St. John the Baptist. So here he was in 1340. Here he was in about 1460. Completely different image, very lavish dress, sit, uh, standing on uh, tiled pavements. How can we identify him as St. John the Baptist? Well, at the bottom here, 
you can see a camel head and underneath his lavish cloak, he had a camel skin. So that identifies him as John the Baptist. So you have to keep on looking out for these clues um, in the images, the clues that help you to identify the images. Back now to the 13th century, and we're in 1320, and this is in the church of St. Peter Walsingham. And I've chosen this because you can see how these figures were neatly fitted into the shapes in the windows. There's an angel with wings. Here's a figure of God the Father. Here are people rising up into heaven. And you can see how the glass was made to fit into these very small shapes. And now for something completely different. We, were, we saw in this image figures of angels in the same spaces you can fit these very strange creatures with an upturned nose and strange things for ears and a head, uh, a sort of human head and an animal body. And it's even more marked here, and this is in the Church of Ringland, where we have a human being playing a musical instrument, but he's got... Um, the lower part of him looks like a horse. And this was what was happening in England before the Black Death. And the Black Death, of course, was 1348 to 1349, a major ep epidemic, rather like the coronavirus of its age. Although in England, it killed somewhere around 40 to 50% of the population. So much worse than coronavirus, but an epidemic nonetheless. And there was a, it, there was a period at which these um, secular, these sort of satirical, these strange images came into um, stained glass, into manuscripts, into carvings in wood and stone. And they were not so prevalent after the Black Death, but I think it's really interesting to show you that not all images were religious images. And again, just to emphasize the point that not all images were religious images, I want to show you this beautiful image of a horse, of a pack horse. You can see he's carrying stuff on his back and he's tied to the horse in front of him. And this is also in the church of Milan, where we saw the in this where we saw the figure of John the Baptist, Catherine, and Margaret. In another window are these two horses, and I also wanted to tell you to show you this because it indicates that you can make images in stained glass not just by adding colour, but by scraping and painting. So the black uh, the black um, hatching here would have been made by painting and some of this would have been made by scraping with a knife or a brush. So you can paint pictures on glass by scraping and painting not only by putting in lots of colour. And again this is a beautiful image of two hunting dogs and this would have been made by painting and scraping on the glass. And you can see the way this has been done beautifully um, to show that they're walking on the earth with plants in the background. Now I'm going to go back to religious images and how you can recognize them. So this is at the top end of a window and it's a series of prophets and kings. So you can recognize the kings because they've got crowns and you can recognize the prophets because they've got these very strange sort of turban-like headdresses. And they were images from the Old Testament of the Bible, which talks about kings and prophets. And they would have fitted in, these are at the top of the windows, and they would have fitted in with what the main images in the lower part of the windows. But those images in the lower part of the windows haven't survived. And just to make that point again, 
here is another of those series at the top of the windows and these are all bishops and you can tell because they've got their mitres on and they're carrying croziers or star and there are a whole series of them and this series at the top of the window would have been linked to the main images further down the window and again in this window only the tops survived the main part of the window, the main images did not survive. Now you might know that in the 16th century in England we suffered from the Reformation, a time when the Catholic interpretation of Christianity was rejected and most images and other art in churches was destroyed or painted over and much glass was smashed. Then a century later there was another period when King Charles I was beheaded and those who replaced him went round destroying religious imagery. So if glass survived the 16th and 17th centuries, it was very fortunate. But in many places, fragments survived. And here is a very good example of what happened when fragments of su survived. So if you look at this image, it looks like a complete story, a complete image of an angel. But if you look closely, it's made up of all little bits. That wing doesn't really belong to that head. Those two arms are different. The, this, it doesn't fit together completely. And there are all these bits around the side, but it makes an interesting whole image. And this was what happened in the 19th and 20th centuries when people came to put fragments together to try to repair the damage of earlier centuries. Now, this is what a whole window looks like. And this is in the church of Old Buckingham in Norfolk. And it's a really good example of a whole window. It tells the story of the life of the Virgin Mary. But don't be deceived, it wasn't made for that church and it wasn't made in the Middle Ages. Rather, it was made in the Middle Ages, but it wasn't made for that church. It was made for a church in Germany. And in the early 19th century, when Napoleon was occupying and destroying um, churches and abbeys in Europe, some of these windows were saved and brought to Norfolk in the 19th century. So this whole window was brought from Germany in the 19th century and put into the church in Buckingham. I mean, it's a really good example. It's a whole, it tells a whole story of the life of the Virgin. Now, also it's important to remember how the windows were paid for. These were expensive pieces of art and who had the money to pay for them? Well, in the Middle Ages, it was either priests or um, the aristocracy, or even as we move through the 15th century, the local gentry. And this is a very good example here. This is Sir Ralph Shelton and his wife, Margaret, and they paid for the whole church and the glass in the, um, in the village of Shelton, which was called after them. And at the bottom of the window, if you had any doubts about that, you could work it out from here because here is a, a ton or a barrel known as a ton in the Middle Ages. And on the top is a shell. And if you say those two words together, shell ton, you get Shelton. So there was no mistaking who paid for that church and who paid for the glass. Now, Back to the, to the map, and I'm going to talk very quickly um, about two particular churches. Um, one, um, East Harling, which is here down in the south of the county, not that far from um, Cambridge, and one in the northwest, Outwell, not that far from Kings Lynn. And this is the Church of East Harling, beautiful um, 15th century church, very well known for its glass. And here is one of the images. And the glass survived, the glass was 
really paid for by somebody called Anne Harling in the 15th century. And she put her mark on all the windows. There were the stars. She loves stars and there are stars in several of the windows, which uh, was her mark. And it survived, the glass survived because her family hid it all in the Reformation. She was a wealthy woman and she was very concerned about giving prominence to women. So you see women appearing in many of the images. Here is the Virgin Mary visiting her cousin Elizabeth. Um, and when Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Christ, of Jesus Christ. And here you see another image of the birth of Christ with the shepherds visiting Christ, carrying a lamb, playing a musical instrument with a crook. And this is also interesting because you've got the deep blues and the deep reds and the silver stain, the yellow, but a lot of white glass around it. And the, the good thing about this is that the white glass makes it easy to concentrate on, to see the deep colours, to read the image as a whole story. It highlights the story part of the image. And I'm going now to Outwell in the northwest of, or rather the west of the county of Norfolk, quite close to Lincolnshire, quite close to Cambridgeshire. And this is the church, again, a beautiful, large 15th century church. And inside we see something completely different. And the reason for this is that this glass was made in the early 16th century, quite close to the date of the Reformation. And you can see the deep blues and the deep reds and the, and the yellow, the silver stain, but you can also see plenty of white glass. And we've got local saints here from East Anglia, and we've got St. Olaf, St. Edmund, St. Edward, um, really telling us that this glass was very much part of East Anglia, part of Norfolk. But also down here, we've got three crowns for the Diocese of Ely. So this church was on the border of Cambridgeshire and Norfolk and was proud to be in that position. Um, I just want to concentrate on one image. This is an image of St Agatha here and you can see, you can see it in it, the run of images. And there she is uh, as a whole and she was martyred by having her breast cut off um, and, and was attacked with a spear. Um, but my interest here is the face and the headdress. And if you look at that, look at the, how close it is to this image here, the face, the sleeves and the headdress. And the reason for this is because Outwell was very close to the North Sea. And in the late 15th century, it was very close links with Flanders or present day Belgium, the near continent. And so there were lots of artistic influences between the two. And this glass was made in Flanders in 1490s. And I think this glass was probably put into Outwell Church in about 1500. So very close in time. And that's a very, very quick scamper through the glass of Norfolk across different centuries. And I want to end with this image of an angel. It's a very close up picture of an angel and just to show you that there's not much colored glass in this but you can make a beautiful face by painting and scratching and adding the silver stain to the hair and you've really created a beautiful face by using all the techniques in the tool book of stained glass and just before I finish, I want to um, emphasize that if you do have a chance to go and look at any of these images in the churches in Norfolk, the really important thing is to take step to take binoculars with you 
and a good camera because very often these images are at the top of the windows and can't easily be seen. What I'm showing you now are very high quality close-up photographs. That's not necessarily what they will look like when you go in person. So you do need to go armed with the right tools to enjoy the visit. And I hope that you get an opportunity to go and see some of the images. Thank you.